On today's On Q Insight, we travel to Winona State University to learn about the history of Minnesota's cooperative system. Dr. Craig Upright is a professor of sociology who studies contemporary social movements and the multiple ways that food production and consumption influence social processes. Today's talk revolves around the food co-op movement from the 1920s forward. And as you will hear, Minnesota has been called a cooperative commonwealth. Let's join Dr. Upright at his recent lecture. There's lots of different types of co-ops that are out there. What is a co-op? It, uh, really simply, it's an economic form of organization. And it has owners, but the owners are helping to work the store. And, and the owners are not deriving profit in the same ways that a, a private corporation might have. There's lots of different types of cooperatives. Worker cooperatives, producer cooperatives, consumer cooperatives. And a lot of what I'll be talking about later on in this talk is consumer cooperatives. Now, cooperatives might have this association with socialism or with communism. It's about collectives that are coming together in order to, as I say, help promote the common good. And yet, what's interesting about all of the co-ops that I've been studying is that they had to work within the existing capitalist system. They weren't necessarily trying to smash that system. But instead, they were providing a corrective to some of the deficiencies that they were seeing. Now, cooperatives have a long history in the United States. In fact, before our country was founded, uh, we have this law from the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1646. They didn't have Times New Roman font on their computers at that time. So I found something that's the, the most old timey that I could find. Because the harvest of hay, corn, flax, and hemp comes usually so near together that much loss can hardly be avoided. The constable of every town, upon request made to him, shall require artificers and handicraftsmen meet to labor to work by the day for their neighbors, needing him in mowing. Now, this idea of volunteering to help your neighbors, to cooperate in this, uh, it wasn't exactly voluntary because we have a law that's requiring you to do that. And as Max Weber uh, has, has suggested, any time you have a rule or a law, that's a sign of some past conflict. So apparently, there was some issue here where the constable needed to be called in. And yet, cooperatives, they did develop, and they did develop voluntarily. Uh, there were a number of cooperatives in the early 20th or early 19th century. Um, 1782, uh, Philadelphia Contributorship for the Insurance of Houses, founded by uh, Benjamin Franklin, who was also very involved in free libraries in Philadelphia. In 1810, there were dairy cooperatives, cheese cooperatives, 1820, hog slaughtering in Granville, Ohio. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of these cooperatives in the United States have something to do with agricultural production. And that's because agricultural production is a very risky business. And if you can band together with some of your uh, fellow laborers in order to help guarantee that the crops can be brought in, that they can be taken to market, that there, that there will be fair prices for all this, um, that helps smooth any sort of market vagaries that might be existing. Minnesota has been called a cooperative commonwealth. There were a lot of cooperatives that formed in the 19th century. This is the Climax Cooperative Creamery in Climax, Minnesota. This is the Finland Cooperative Store in Finland, Minnesota, which is still in operation today. They have a Facebook page now, so you can check them out if you want. And this is not a consumer cooperative, uh, but the Franklin Cooperative Creamery Association. I just love this photo. And so this is from the 1920s. There were lots of cooperatives that formed throughout Minnesota uh, in the largest cities, but also um, in, in the rural landscape as well. Now, cooperatives started to get some notice from the federal government. The Bureau of Labor Statistics, which was founded in the late 1890s, was very interested in consumer cooperatives starting around the 1920s. There is a woman named Florence Parker who was hired by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. She was actually a native of Minneapolis. And she was a proponent of consumer cooperatives for the three decades that she worked at the Bureau of Labor Statistics. This is one of the first reports that the BLS uh, produced. And, and she had to help introduce the idea of consumer cooperatives to her public. 
The word cooperation, she says, has within the past few years taken on a new significance to many people of the United States. Today, it means more than simply working together. Cooperation in most instances, it is true, makes its appeal to the enlightened self-interest of the individual. It is looked to as a means of lightening the burden of high prices and low wages, but the element of idealism and altruism inherent in the movement gives it a wider significance and appeal than a strictly economic movement might have. So we're thinking here about what is in the best interest of the individual, but also what is in the best interest of larger society. You can pursue your own self-interest, but perhaps there can be some extra benefit that's provided as well. And by banding together in a consumer cooperative, you might be able to achieve some of your common goals. One thing that's very useful about these Bureau of Labor Statistics reports is that Florence Parker and her associates they spent a lot of time uh, distributing surveys, collecting information, trying to figure out what does the consumer cooperative landscape look like across the United States. So by compiling all of these reports, we can start to get a sense of how consumer cooperation grew between 1920 and 1950. The number of societies, it was in, well, 1933. That was not a very good year for American business. Um, but cooperatives, they started to grow again in the 1930s and into the 1940s. The number of members increases from 100,000 to over 1 million. The cooperatives themselves are getting a little bit larger. You can see the number of members per capita, and certainly the sales are increasing. It was during the 1930s that the federal government really started to promote cooperatives in lots of different areas. This is, of course, during the Great Depression, and uh, FDR and his economic team are trying to figure out anything that they can do to help those who are unemployed, who, who are uh, perhaps uh, suffering from not having enough wages. Consumer cooperatives was seen as one possible solution for this. There was even several experimental communities that were created. Greenbelt, Maryland is one that was founded upon cooperative principles. And so you have banks, you have grocery stores, you, you have uh, the emerging telephone exchanges, all based on this cooperative model. So cooperatives are being supported by the federal government. And one nice thing about these statistics, these reports that Florence Parker was uh, accumulating, is that they broke down where these cooperatives are. So we can take a look at, in the 1920s, Minnesota actually had the most number of cooperatives in terms of uh, the percentage. They had quite a few members, um, percent per 1,000, and quite a few sales. It took a little while for Wisconsin to catch up. That happens a lot. Uh, but in 1936, Wisconsin does become number two. Minnesota has had this very long tradition of banding together as consumer cooperatives, trying to help each other, but also trying to help promote the common good. This is one cooperative in the 1950s in St. Paul. This is the Credjafon Co-op store on Rondo Avenue. Credjafon is kind of an odd name. Uh, it's one that was made up. There were 10 members of the Credjafon Social Club, and they just took one letter from each of their names to come up with this new name. Uh, this is a, uh, an interior view of the Credjafon uh, Co-op store on Rondo Avenue. And you can see the nice co-op sign in the background. So why do cooperatives exist? Well, one possible answer is that they are addressing some of the deficiencies of free market capitalism. It can be seen as a hostile market, and consumer cooperatives help consumers navigate that market. Why might it be hostile? Well, there might be for-profit firms who are engaged in monopolistic pricing. If they don't have any competition, then they're able to charge whatever they want. And second, they might be some goods or services that are not actually being satisfied by for-profit firms. I worked in restaurants for a number of years, and when I was first promoted to be a kitchen manager, the owner of that restaurant said, Craig, you only have two jobs as a manager. You need to do the things that only you can do. And second, you need to do the things that nobody else wants to do, which I have found works pretty well in academic committees at universities, too. Uh, you can think of consumer cooperatives 
in the same way. Can they do the things that only they can do? Are they able to forge connections with each other, uh, with other producers, in order to, to bring down prices, to give their consumers a little bit more control in the market? And second, are they able to do the things that no one else wants to do? One reason that you saw so many consumer cooperatives in these rural cities throughout Minnesota is that it, there's not a great profit incentive to go to a small town that only has 500 or 1,000 people, but you can band together to create a store that didn't actually exist before. So that's a little bit about co cooperatives as economic organizations. Uh, the focus of, of my research has been the new wave cooperatives that emerged during the 1970s. I started my research wanting to explain the origins of the organic food industry. Now, this was a period of time when interest in organic food was rising. We had a number of celebrated food scares in the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, there were concerns about the pesticides that were, were poisoning the apples and the cranberries. But we also had this big countercultural movement that was suggesting that Whatever the man wants us to do, it must not be very good. And when they took a look at some of the, the processed foods, the preservatives that were being put in, all of these conveniences of modern living, they questioned it. They challenged it. They, they were concerned on economic grounds, on social grounds, on cultural grounds, and on sustainability grounds. This is one of the co-ops that formed during that time period, the Seward Community Co-op. Yeah, this is around Franklin Avenue in Minneapolis. This is the Wedge Co-op, which formed a few years later. And they look quite a bit like the Mariposa Co-op of just a few years ago. And if you take a look at how these cooperatives grew, start from zero in 1970, going up, growing up through 1975, and then really starting to take off after 1980. But it was primarily co-ops in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. They experienced the most, most growth between 1970 and 1975. And then something happens in 1975 where there's a lot more outstate co-ops that are forming. So we really have two, phase, two phases of cooperative development. Now, how is it that we're going to explain this? Well, as I took a look at where these cooperatives were founded, as I was talking to people about what their mindset was as they were creating cooperatives, I discovered that there was this very strong political association with the co-ops in the early 1970s. Again, we have anti-war demonstrators who are volunteering for co-ops. We have, have, we have pacifists. We have people who are really against the man, uh, who are against mainstream culture that are trying to create these organizations and make them last. One way of trying to isolate where these communities were is to take a look at who was supporting George McGovern in the 1972 presidential election. These were liberal oases. These were outposts. These were high concentrations of people who were, who were against the Vietnam War and taking that opposition very seriously. That helps explain. In fact, I took a look at all of the areas that had high level of support for McGovern, and they all end up with a co-op. The movement progresses. It keeps building. This is one of the original co-ops of that 1970 to 1975 time, the Mill City Co-op. And we've got people who are protesting. Now, why would you protest a co-op? Um, Perhaps you're against their liberal anti-Vietnam War attitudes. But no, these are actually other cooperative, cooperators who are protesting some of the policies that Mill City was trying to adopt. There's one sign here that you see, CO, go take over Red Owl. Red Owl was one of the large grocery chains in town at that time. But what does CO mean? CO stood for the co-op organization. This is a period of time known as the Co-op Wars. 1974 and 1975, there was a group of reformers who were taking a look at this growing movement, and they thought, they've got it all wrong. Yeah, they're interested in organic, natural food. How bourgeois can you possibly get? Is this food for the people? 
Is this food for the workers? We don't want this. The co-op organization, the CEO, was interested in taking over some of these co-ops in large part because they wanted to create this, this vanguard for the coming workers' revolution. They were, they were devoted Marxists. And they started to take over some of the co-ops whenever they could. Now, at the time, these are relatively small organizations. And it only takes a few members to actually come and, and take over. If you have a dozen people, you can go join the co-op and you can start to set different policies, set different directions. That's what was going on at Mill City. Some of the other co-ops, they were objecting. And here, we, this is what we see. Now, what was the big issue that the CEO was pushing for? Canned beans. The workers need canned beans. The growing revolution is going to be fed with canned beans. And so, it's seriously, this is canned beans versus dry beans that you have to soak overnight and then boil it yourself. But it was this idea that convenience, convenient foods, don't be trying to do your hoity-toity organics on us. We want to do food for the people. So they had this primary distribution center, the People's Warehouse. And they thought, let's take it over. They go in with some baseball bats. They take over the cash receipts, the financial records. They go into some of the other co-ops. And then seriously, this is what's going on. OK, there's physical violence taking place. There was one um, cooperator, Mo Burton, who found his truck firebombed the next day after he was resisting some of the entreaties of the CEO. So this is what's going on in 1975 into 1976. One article in the Minneapolis Tribune at the time, um, the poor people in the community want foods they can get elsewhere but at cheaper prices. As if a co-op is truly to serve the community, it would look like a 7-Eleven store with cheaper prices. What happened Friday was necessary to get co-op coordinators to listen to us. This is referring to some of the violence that had taken place. If violence concurred, it was necessary and it will be used again if needed. Well, the co-op community went through this process of re-examining itself, trying to figure out how they could stay federated, working with each other, but trying to resist, purge some of the CO members. And eventually, it did get resolved in favor of those who were promoting food. As part of the response to the People's Warehouse controversy, most of the co-ops formed what's called the All Cooperating Association, the ACA. And they created a new distribution center called DANCE, the Distributing and Alliance of, of North Country Cooperatives. And they tried to figure out how it is that they could still forge these distribution networks, but still work with each other as well, emphasizing cooperation among cooperatives. And one function of the ACA was education. Chris Olson, in particular, was charged with going out and helping those who were interested in forming new cooperatives, tell them how it's done. They produced pamphlets, books. They had lawyers. They had accountants to try to tell people, if you want to do this, we can help you. And it was largely in due to that that you had this tremendous growth from 1975 to 1980. Now, do they follow the same pattern as those from 1970 to 1975? No. You can take a look at the McGovern votes for where these co-ops open. This is just one year, 1976. Uh, we've got Bryan Central in Minneapolis. OK, yes, McGovern did get something there. Heartland Foods in Little Falls. No, McGovern didn't do so great. In fact, he did worse in the area around where this co-op formed than in the larger community. You see that same pattern in Grand Rapids, okay, Grand Marais. These were not organizations with a strong political focus. They were interested in getting more natural organic food, but they did not develop evenly across the state. I go back to those BLS records that were compiled by Florence Parker. Where were the co-ops in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s? It turns out that if a small community had a co-op of any sort during that time period, they were much more likely to get a new wave co-op in the late 1970s. It was familiarity with the organizational form that made them think, yeah, co-op, we can do that. 
And those were the areas that were most receptive. So we've got cooperatives, organic food, the counterculture. What about promoting the common good? I'm interested in the co-op wars. It's a fascinating story. But really, I'm more interested in what happened afterwards and how it is that we can evaluate why these co-ops formed the way they did, why they still exist today. One phrase that I heard so often when I was talking to cooperative activists is, food is power. I didn't have the sense to ask them, what does that actually mean? Uh, but, but they kept saying it over and over again. And I've thought about it many times since. And what I think is that these new wave cooperatives, they were actually resisting power. So what are the cooperatives? What sort of power are they actually resisting? Now, it's possible that they were resisting the government that was forcing people to eat canned foods. But we know that that wasn't going on. Instead, there was something going on with the agenda. And I think that the co-op organizers were interested in the agenda. What are people going to address? What are these co-ops actually going to be used for? And those who are on the side of food were much more interested in the subtle form of power. That's much more cultural than it is structural. How is it that we can try to convince people to try to eat foods that are more in their own best interest? In some ways, the, the activists of this time, the organic activists, the cooperative activists, they won. They really did dramatically change the culture. I don't give them complete full credit, but they were part of this movement that was creating the market infrastructure, that was promoting organic food, and eventually it became popular enough that large agribusiness, they took notice. This diagram is of the major acquisitions of smaller brands over the last 30 years, I believe. Um, uh, and, and he, well, you can't see it very well, I know. Let's just focus on General Mills, something a little bit closer to home. Uh, Muir Glen was acquired by Cascadian Farm in March of 1988. Cascadian Farm was acquired by General Mills. A lot of the organic food products are now owned by those same companies that were being protested against in the 1970s. So organic food has become very popular, and there's still lots of issues that have to be addressed. But the co-ops, they still exist. Why do they still exist? The distinguishing feature of the cooperative landscape, this is a quote from Florence Parker once again, is that it exists for the common good. Every economy in a manufacturing distribution, every advance in efficiency or improvement in machinery benefits every member instead of going as profits to one person or one class. Co-ops have this principle of helping the common good built into their very beings. Those principles that I talked about, the Rochdale principles, they have been adopted, adapted over the years. Uh, the International Cooperative um, Alliance uh, has, has suggested that these are the main principles of contemporary consumer cooperatives. And these are the principles that are oftentimes referred to in co-op websites. Voluntary open membership, demand, democratic member control. But let's look specifically at education, training, and information. Cooperation among cooperatives, concern for community. One reason that the co-ops were able to survive and thrive from the 1980s onward is that they went back to these principles with the ACA, with their education component that was being promoted by Chris Olson. They were somehow finding a way of working together while still remaining independent in order to pursue some of their common goals. Individual ambition serves the common good quote that many of you might be familiar with, it comes from Adam Smith, and it forms the basis of his idea that the invisible hand of the market will benefit all of society. If all individuals are pursuing their own individual interests, that somehow, magically, the common good will be served. And perhaps that's true, but note that Adam Smith is not suggesting that individual ambition serves the entire common good. There might be a lot of instances where individual ambition can't satisfy one particular need. So I suggest that cooperatives exist, that cooperatives still have a role to play when they are trying to address issues of market failure. 
when somehow there is some deficiency, when there's something that the market is not going to be taken care of. Cooperatives do this by assisting other members of the cooperatives. Certainly, when you are acting as a cooperative, you are trying to do something in the interest of that particular collective. Second, they're supporting community economic markets. So the benefits go beyond themselves. As they are trying to, in this case, prop up the organic food industry, they're setting up distribution systems, they're also helping the environment. This is a benefit to all members of society, not just those who are members of cooperatives. And finally, they support social projects that benefit these non-members. That's a taste of the research that I've been conducting. With that, I'm done. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.